I'm Connie Majonta and I'm from Sending Buffalo. Uh, Tatanka Naji, where we say in our Dakota language. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a very small community, but I said, uh, we try to keep our language very strong. Uh, we are learning. Uh, we have Dakota classes uh, for our young people, for our middle, and a lot of our older people come in and <coughs> share. And then sometimes we, we talk about the, the language, what it meant to us as growing up as a small, as I said, <coughs> growing up as a small child, you're always told a little bit in Dakota, and a lot of times they always say, well, we want you to learn English. We want you to, to have the language, uh, and your other languages can be basic. But I said, I, so I learned. I really had to really learn, and my grandmother was from Carrot Kettle, and, and so I learned both languages, Nakota plus Dakota. I had to listen to when they talk. Okay? So, it, it, it helped me grow inside. And I think when I look at that is, is one of the things that makes me very strong for myself is, uh, is when we have, we have our elders group and we try to do things together and we sh try to talk you know, fluent as much as we can as a group. And it's really going, I see it blossoming. I always say, oh, it's so good when you come back from the meeting. What did you learn? Everybody shared in the language. Yeah? We talked about it, and we always say, please don't talk about politics. We always just trying to kind of keep everything basic. Yeah? So we have the ladies group, which we started uh, doing star blankets, and we start making skirts. We start making shawls for our, some of our young, the young children. So we, uh, and I think that's one of the things we need to really bring back is helping them learn uh, how to sew and how to do, um, like we teach each other with moccasins, teach each other with making star blankets and basically everything. Eh? Then we have a cooking class, everybody makes uh, different I said food for the f uh, Sundance or food for the feast, whatever. So we help each other that way. Eh? And then, like I said, we have a, some of them said, well, we're going to go picking. And when I said, well, all the young people need to go picking. We old people can't be falling in a bush and <laughs> never will we won't be able to get up. And I so we left there for a while. And so we, said, we always laugh, joke. And today, when we talk with the young kids, I, I have my you know, one of my nieces works in Head Start, and she always says, "Auntie, come and spend time with the kids." You know, so I go, and we talk about, we share the colors. We teach them. I teach them the colors, like Z, uh, yellow, red, black. I say them. And if you say that to me, tell me again. And they say it, eh? not clear, but I always pray, oh, that's so good. You do so well in that, you know. So you encourage. I always say, you've got to encourage, and it has to start from the home. I try my best. When my grandkids come to visit me, is I always say, I bet the wash day. And they look at me. And I said, a good day. That means a bet a wash day, a good day. Chante un nape choose. I shake hands with, with you from the bottom of my heart. That's what I tell them. And when we're done talking, I say, mitako wase. And that's a prayer, I always say. When you say that, when you see grandma and grandpa, you shake hands, you say, mitako wase. You teach them the language and those basic little things like that. They, they, they learn, eh? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's helpful. I believe in, in, in helping understand and help them who they are. Cause, and as I said, is in, in the Dakota language, when we say children, and we say wakaja, when we say that, it means the little sacred ones or little holy ones. That's what it means when we say wakaja. So it's, it's, if you, you, I always say the language is so powerful 
in, in all races, and no matter if you're Cree or Soto or whatever it is, you, if you talk the language in a positive way, it's going to blossom in that child. Language is culture, and it's very, uh, to articulate something from, from the inner self, it's great when you have your own language to do it. it. You can tell a joke, for example, and it can be hilarious. You switch it to English, and English interpretation can be direct. It's the concept, and if somebody doesn't interpret, it's not even funny. Or out to lunch. So language is important, but to recall again historically that we were not allowed to use our language. And our, um, <clears throat> a lot of our uh, people that went before us were punished severely for using the language and therefore didn't want to see the next generation of their loved ones punished, go through the punishment they went through. Plus, they were taught, I know in my reserve, one of the comments I heard is, you don't want to teach your children the dog language, which was Cree, mm. because it doesn't take them anywhere. They have to learn English. I wouldn't blame that alone, but I know um, from my time when English, Cree was very fluent, it started going down. But now there's a revitalization coming. But the other thing I noticed was there was a shame base to speak in Cree. Like it really, really bothered me. Like when I took my nurse and it was out of province, I was the only native person in the class. And I just missed talking Cree. That when I got to, into Prince Albert, it was Wow, I can talk Cree now. And I ran into two uh, individuals I'd gone to school with. I started talking Cree, and one told me, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand that language. And the other one said, I never spoke Cree. What made you think? And the thing is, I knew they did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but to not accept, to drop it, and tears me just wanting to talk, and nobody, well, I could talk to anybody, but they didn't respond because they didn't understand. And that was how sad it was that it went down. Yet, at the same token, I seen people from different uh, other groupings of people that spoke their language so proudly. And here's my own uh, relatives, friends, I felt ashamed to speak their language. And therefore, it's important that uh, to, again, start teaching them in that classroom, one word at a time, and uh, pat them. There was one child I never forgot was way up north. Well, they spoke very fluent Cree. And some of the northern areas, to me, was the most exciting time to be able to teach when this, you could start in the Cree language and then transition to the English, it was very speeded up knowledge because you grounded the information. But that one time I came out of the building and there was a little wee boy and he, there was, um, oh, what do you call those, but a snowmobile. And uh, he took he looked at me and said, in Cree, do you know how to operate this? And I said, no. And then he said, uh, kind of looked at me, and then he said, did you want to learn? <laughs> anyway, we had, uh, he taught me how. And I thought, these are skills of a northern little boy. He wasn't in any preschool yet. He was just tiny. And, uh, but the other thing, I told him, how do you work it when you speak two languages? He said, I look at the person, I try and guess, but if I speak Korean, and they look like they don't understand, then I switch to English and the other way around. But when I figure it's both, I just use both languages. 
And I thought, what a good teacher that little one had. Probably Mushom and Kokum. And I think we can incorporate that uh, with confidence, the belief system that children can learn, will learn mm -hmm. at that level. We can learn at any time. We're capable of it. And uh, we can do it and we will do it. Like myself, I found that I really needed French at one time. So I said, yes, I can. I went and took some French lessons. All I needed was conversational. Mm -hmm. Then Ukrainian, I need conversational for work I was doing. Mm -hmm. And you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things like uh, my grandchildren, I tell them, do it one word at a time, sentence at a time. So there's one that phones me every day. And it gets on longer and longer. And uh, he'll ask me questions and repeat it. And I write out words for him. And he's come along real good. So I think uh, one is to give yourself permission to learn. I can do it. And uh, to also realize that uh, happens to be a very beautiful, important language. And uh, the dialects are different. Mm -hmm. I have to watch the dialects. My dialect might sound like I'm cursing somebody in another dialect. When, when we're on the land, what I found especially with children is I mean, as adults, we know we go on vacation, <laughs> so we can be on the land. <laughs> and it takes us away from the stress we have in our work life. Little kids have their own kind of stress. Maybe we're not aware of it or we're not really in tune with it, but they do. They have their own stresses based on the way that they think, based on their experiences. And there are things that they're good at handling and there are things that they're not so good at handling and they try to express it through their emotions but sometimes we do you know shh don't don't cry now you're fine there's nothing wrong with you well I think that we should let them say it and when you have the freedom of being outside you have that opportunity to yell as loud as you want to to say the things that you feel like you need to say but you also are getting back the calmness that you get from just being on the land, being around plants, being around natural waters, being under the sky and the clouds and sitting in the sun. And those things all contribute to us knowing what it is to feel calm. And sometimes we have to learn, especially if we're in, raised in urban setting or in an urban setting all the time, we have to learn what is it to feel calm and how can we bring that forward in, in ourselves so that we can feel calm, we can hear our own thoughts and we can really be in touch with what our inner feelings are. Well, I actually live with a teacher. <laughs> My <laughs> husband is a teacher. So he's constantly using his teacher skills on us. <laughs> but we enjoy it. And that's one of the main things, enjoyment. Enjoyment. Not just for people and young people to be engaged, but and then enjoyment. Because emotion is a really big part of the things we remember. So I had a chance to go with my husband to the university I went as his helper and he was teaching indigenous games to them. And when they were meeting, they're all standing in a row, just, you know, properly like this. And, and they say their names and who they are. And then once he taught them how to play the game and got them involved in the game, and then they're in, fully engaged in the game and they're really hitting and pushing and, <laughs> and playing really hard, you could see part of their personality come out that you didn't see before when they were standing properly and introducing themselves. And the discussions that happened after that were really vibrant and really, 
really uh, full of emotions and, and little details that they notice that, you know, we don't even always notice when people are playing these games. And these traditional games, they come from elements of the land. They come from elements of our stories of the past. And so they help to connect us as indigenous people back to those stories and back to the land. But they also help to connect non-indigenous people to what is indigenous knowledge and why is it important? And why is it important, especially here in the place that we, we know as indigenous people, we come from here, so that's why it's important. And as newcomers, they've come from somewhere else to come here and live and become a part of that. And so that level of uh, engagement and, and activity and enjoyment is one of the biggest things I think that made an impression on me. There was a visitor amongst that group and he came from New Zealand and he's the one who pointed out to us that inside the building when they were learning in the classroom, the people were all very quiet and, you know, attentive and proper and listening. And, and he said, now they come out here and they just went wild and they're just laughing and they're rolling around and they're competitive and they're doing all kinds of things that they didn't do inside the classroom. So maybe the classroom can open the door and let some of that come in so that there's, it's seamless between the classroom and outdoor activities. Well, with myself as a child, it was playing outside, very simple games, but I always marvel at the trust our parents had also. Mine today, do, do, do. <laughs> we just roamed. <laughs> I remember one of the games we used to play was Throwing knives in the uh, sand, <laughs> and then there's different combinations. If my little grandchildren did that, I don't know how calm I could be. <laughs> but our parents and community was calm because that was a, a community thing. Yeah. But on the other hand, we were also being taught mm. if you want to be have fun, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> don't let anything restrain you. And I remember coming one day, I stopped and visit this one elder coming from the clinic on my way home, and I stopped to visit her. She was sitting on her veranda, just soaking wet. Oh, what happened to you? She said, the child in me came out. I sat here watching children running through the water. <laughs> so she said, I made a dash for it. <laughs> Did it ever feel good? And I think uh, those children again do that. But we need to allow them the freedom, but we also need to uh, teach them that us, we can be free to for emotional well being. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go see. I think the most important thing about play is that our children get that sense of freedom. There's no one telling you how to play or how you're supposed to play. It's a time when your mind is just completely free and you get to do whatever you can think of. Mm -hmm. So as a child, you're, you're thinking of things all the time. And for, for us as parents, that's kind of a dangerous area <laughs> because they're thinking of things all the time. But I remember uh, my favorite time was when we would go to our grandma and grandpa's house and we would stay there for two weeks with no parents because our grandma and grandpa would just say okay go outside and play now and we'd go outside and they were on a farm with big open spaces sheds and outbuildings and we climbed in every one of those and we explored all of them and and we climbed the big pear tree. I, I was attacked by a squirrel one time because I climbed too close to its <laughs> nest. But these are all things that you learn from. And even when children are really small, just to let them in the grass or in the dirt, they're experiencing it and they're, they're learning about it and they're coming to understand how they are connected to Mother Earth. And that's something that we need to include 
and I feel kind of sad when I see some of the play spaces that we have. Uh, we live in a townhouse now, and and there's just a long, really narrow play space there. And to run, you just are running up and down that one space. And I think of how we had so much space to run in. Mm. And yeah, things did happen to us. <laughs> we got <laughs> hurt and, and we fell down. But that too, there's guidance there for what do you do when, when those kinds of things happen to you. So being able to play freely and that doesn't mean our parents weren't watching us. It meant that they were giving that distance to let us explore and to let us enjoy things. And we came up with all kinds of games ourselves. We made mm -hmm. up games and, and played those games with each other, with the, with the cousins or with the, our relatives that were there. That, and we all learned the same game because we made it up and, mm -hmm. and we made rules. And, mm -hmm. And it taught us how to play, too, with other people and taught us how to communicate mm -hmm. with other people mm -hmm. because if you want to play with somebody, you have to be able to get along with them. Yeah. You can't just always have everything your way. You have to let them have mm -hmm. things their way, too. Yeah. I said we, uh, we learned to play outside a lot. I said growing up when I was a child, I think about that and where today is, uh, we always had to play outside, you know. As long as you come back from school, you change your clothes and you're out there. You're playing in the dirt, you're playing in the wood pile or whatever. You're always doing something or you're picking there. We're gonna take a pail and we're gonna go pick berries. Pay, you know, always something we had to do as a child when I remember. And go, f we went for a walk. We walked to school, walked back up, walked back down. We lived on top and the school was at the bottom. So we were back and forth. And, and today, you know, the bus comes right up to the door and, you know, they just jump in there and away they're gone again. And I always says, mm-mm, you should walk to school. She looks at me and she said, too far. <laughs> so. They already know it's too far, but for us growing up as as a child, like you know, we had to walk. You know, you change your shoes. You know, as I always say, I always remember. I said, I always had a favorite pair of shoes. Uh, one was a dark brown and a and a black. So what I did is I had I I painted I colored all my shoe black so they could match because I didn't really couldn't have afford to have good shoes <laughs> I always remember that sometimes I'm laughing at my when I go into a, a, a store and I see shoes and I think oh yeah you know I look at the color I said I could color that because <laughs> I always remember doing that as a child eh? it was so much fun today you know we see our children our grandchildren our great grand on you know on phones and iPads and stuff and I just say you know our children are at a point where they don't know where life is going for them you know uh, I always says that we for me, like uh, able to do my laundry, be able to sew, be able to make your bannock, be able to make your soup, and I always make that little girl cut, cut up um, the vegetables, carrots, whatever I'm doing. I try to get her to do that. So she, I always say, when you're a mommy, you too will do this with your babies. You know, I encourage try to bring that forward to them so they could see that, because. We were told, you know, how you are as a person, as a mom, that's how your children become. And I, and like I said, I was thinking of Kathy, you know, you live in a townhouse and you don't have much, and I have a big area at my place, hey, I live under us on Sanding Buffalo, so we got all, you know, we got, I have a garden here, the other, the other part, my brother has a garden, we all go over there, help, we, so they learn, they learn to do those things outside, because sometimes a lot of people don't have gardens, you know, and we try to keep that up, and, and like I said, we were putting in our garden, and I said, hurry, it's, look, it's really dark out there, I said, storm coming, let's get the potatoes in. So I only did five rows. Of <laughs> I'm lazy, getting lazy. So I only put five rows. Last year I put 
I put 12 rows of potatoes. This year I only put five, so I'm slowing down. But I, I, so it, I taught them to how to plant. I taught them to do those things because I said, you need to survive, you need to feed your family. Because that's what I was told growing up. You have to learn to, to grow things to feed your family. And you have to build your house. You have to make the best of it because that's where your family is going to be. You know, that's how I grew up. Eh? And I, I always like to when they say we're having land-based teaching at the school. Like I, I said, wow, that's so good. That's so important. We need both because we're so. You know, sitting here with these lights and the cameras and stuff, you know, that's the kind of life it seems we have, this technology. We don't have the basic teaching anymore, eh? I always teach, teach the kids, the little girls to make bannock, to make, help you with making soup, whatever the situation. I said, I haven't dried meat for the last three years. I've just been lazy. I, usually we, I dry meat in the fall. I haven't even done that, you know? Because uh, I just thought, well, maybe somebody will do that for me. <laughs> I'm getting kind of lazy now, but I better smarten up and get going again and doing those things, eh? Because I, uh, I said it's it's important, and I crush crush choke chairs. They go through to machinists. So I just had a flat rock that my grandmother used as a when I was growing up with a, with a hand, and and I have that, eh? So I put a, a tea towel and I was doing that, and she said, "That's so long. That takes long. Put it in a machine; it'll be fast." Put it in a blender, it'll be food processor. See? I said, we were taught how to do those kind of things, you know, crush the berries, dry meat, make bannock, those kind of things. We don't do those things anymore. So we make sandwiches and give your children. We didn't have that. Eh? I sent my grandson to camp and we did dry meat and, and choke cherries and and cranberries and raisins and made a big bag of dry meat and he went, he took that to camp and he said, I was the only one that had dry meat, everybody had noodles, he said. <laughs> so I said, well, at least you had good food. And so he said, but you know what, he said, I, I bartered with that, he said. I asked him to trade, he said, well, did, that's what you did. <laughs> So again, it was nice to hear him talk about those things, so, yeah. I'm talking, I don't know what else to say, I, but that's my dream. That's, I would really like to see men teaching the children to be partners in the school. That's what I would like to see.